All right, we're gonna do our group exercise. If you are in the room, uh, open your resource manual to page 62 and you will find the case study that we'll be using. I'm gonna give you about five minutes to work through the uh, protocol portion of the group exercise. We're going to try to find the slide deck to put the case study up, but I'm going to read through it real quickly. And there'll be eight questions that I want you to answer. And then I'm going to have a couple of tables help us out uh, in groups of two. So the case scenario is that Tim is discharged from 3 East at Memorial Medical Center, MC, MMC, on 2-24-18 after a long hospitalization. On this date, a C. difficile lab ID event is identified. On 1-9-19, he feels ill with fever and is transported to the ER at MMC for assessment. In the ER, he's noted to be dehydrated and hypotensive with concern for sepsis. Blood cultures are collected, diarrhea is noted, antibiotics are initiated, and Tim is admitted to observation status on 1-9. Due to bed availability, he remains in the ER until 1-10 when he transfers to an inpatient medical unit where, again, diarrhea is noted. On 1-12, blood cultures return MRSA positive, so orders are written for inpatient admission. Tim is hypoxic with spike in temperature and continued loose schools. He's transferred to ICU later this day where a stool specimen is collected and submitted for C. difficile testing. The facility standardly tests for CDI using a multi-step algorithm of GDH EIA with PCR for discrepant results. The CD test is reported as GDH positive Toxin negative, PCR positive. Tim stabilizes and transfers to the medical floor on 116, where a single loose stool is noted and submitted for CDI testing. This CDI test is finalized as GDH negative, toxin positive, with no additional testing or results noted on the final lab report. MMC follows FACWIDEN, MRSA bacteremia, and C. difficile lab ID event reporting. So there are eight questions, two are bonus questions. Um, and I would like for you to just take a few minutes and work through those, and then we will review for correct responses. So it's a group exercise, which means you can work amongst the tables. You can work across tables and uh, get help from all your neighbors. Okay, so we are going to go forward with this case. Everybody's been working hard on it. So here's the case, and we are going to start with the protocol questions. And the first question, is there a MRSA bacteremia lab ID event identified? To, go to the microphone. <laughs> this table over here voluntold. <laughs> yes. Yes. And that is because... There is an MRSA positive blood culture. All right, so what location gets the event attribution? We attribute it to the ER. Correct, nicely done, thank you. All right, moving on to question three. Is the MRSA lab ID event considered recurrent due to the prior admission? Why is that? Recurrent is not a eligible categorization for MRSA bacteremic events. All right, so the bonus. 
Memorial conducts active surveillance screening for MRSA and Tim screens positive. Does it change the event determination? No. no, because active surveillance screens aren't eligible for lab ID event reporting. All right, moving on to question five. How many CDI events are identified at MMC? All right, correct, three. Ooh, y'all are listening good. <laughs> what is the date of event? So we have number one occurring on what day? 1224, yeah, don't forget, this is all the same hospital. So this is, an, the first event's 1224. The second event is 112. And the third event is 116. Excellent work, excellent work. All right, number seven. Should the 116 CD finding be disregarded since the algorithm of testing wasn't complete? No. Correct. You have to go with whatever the report identifies. And so here is our bonus. How should the facility answer the quarterly primary testing methodology question? And I did provide the um, drop down menu from NHSN. So, what do you think about that? So, this one is kind of um, an unusual case. In the narrative, we see that the facility states that they standardly test using GDH toxin negative, uh, GDH EIA with PCR for discrepant results. So if that is their standard testing, you could say that is their primary testing and you would answer the question with, um, GDH EIA with PCR for discrepant results. However, you, I, mean, I would question whether or not this truly is their standard testing algorithm since we have a test here that simply is GDH and toxin and there is no PCR follow-up. So in this situation, what I would normally recommend to the facility is you're going to have to look at the volume of the test that has been done over the course of the quarter and see how many tests you have that did go to a discrepant result step of PCR versus how many stopped with just the, uh, the toxin and determine which of those accounts for greater than 50% of testing performed, which would equate to your primary testing method. And it's unfortunate that some facilities do have to, to look at this to really get the most appropriate answer for testing method question answers. But y'all did a, a great job. Thank you. Give yourselves a hand. I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay now, and she's going to, oh no, Karen. Karen's going to do the analysis. Okay, so I hope you guys are ready for the Lab ID event analysis exercises. Um, so for these exercises, anyone viewing the presentation and web streaming, you can access the handouts at this link. Um, so in this exercise, you're going to find eight analysis questions. Um, so take about seven to ten minutes to work on this um, at your table. Um, and of course, raise your hands if you get stuck. We'll be walking around uh, assisting whenever needed. Um, and so we'll be going through all the answers in the end. Um, Feel free again, work together as a group. Um, feel free to identify a team spokesperson. Um, and so while reviewing questions, we will hopefully get a few volunteers. Um, so exercise A, 
we love Denise's Tim so much. We had him focused on for our exercise A. Um, and exercise B, you will find information um, that will help prepare as if you're preparing data for CMS data submission, um, as well as reviewing uh, risk adjustment factors. So some helpful definitions as you're completing the exercises, you will find on the screen the categorizations for onset and CDI assay. And again, let us know if you need any help. All right, how are we doing? Ready for some answers? Okay, so we are going to start with exercise A. Question number one. The line list has a data entry error on Tim's second and third event. Was anyone able to identify the data entry error? Perfect, yes. The date of admission was incorrect. So the facility admission date should actually be 110, not 19. The rationale is because January 10th is when the patient was first placed on that inpatient unit. It doesn't matter when the facility might put them in admission status or observation status. Uh, what counts is when the patient physically moves to that inpatient unit. Okay, um, so question number two. After we fix that data entry error and we correct the facility admission date, how does the CDI line list change? So does anyone wanna to come to the mic and tell us what their table felt for this question? No takers, okay. So the main thing here that changes is your onset column. So for event number two, when we change the facility admission date to the 10th, and we see the specimen date is on the 12th. So that occurs on day two, I'm sorry, day three. However, this patient was previously discharged from the facility and therefore onset is cohicva. Okay, everything else on the line list stayed the same. Okay, why is CDI assay blank for event number three? Yes, yes, correct. I've, I heard that from a few people. So CDI assay is blank when there was a prior positive specimen in the previous 14 days. So remember, we don't use the term recurrent until at least 15 days have passed between that specimen and the prior specimen. Okay, exercise B, and um, we have the answers up here on the slide for onset and for that SIR indicator variable. So event number four is COHICFA, five is community onset, six healthcare onset, seven healthcare onset, eight community onset, nine healthcare onset, 10 community onset, and 11 COHICFA. And for the SIR indicator, all of the events are zero except for event number seven. That should have a one. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so, okay, okay. And we will have the answers posted and available for you as well. Number six. So the facility admission date was 227 and the specimen date was 32. Yes, so that is more than day four or later. So that is healthcare onset. Any other questions about any of these? Okay. So I have the rationales here. I'm again, just repeating the definition for those three categories of onset. We're only looking at the facility admission date and the specimen date. Any prior events for the patient 
are not considered when we define onset, but they are considered when we talk about the SIR numerator. Okay, so uh, questions number three and four for exercise B is which events will be counted in the SIR numerator? Correct. So event number seven, this is the only one that had a one in that indicator column. So that is the event that is counted in the SIR. Okay, question five. So we showed you an example table with the risk factors used for the SIR calculation. And we asked you to identify where there is a potential data quality issue and what additional steps you could do in NHSN to investigate this. Do we have any volunteers? Okay, I'll go ahead and give you the answer. Um, so what jumped out at us is the big change in the CDI community onset prevalence rate in 2019 quarter one. And because that's so much higher than the previous two quarters, that should be a trigger for you to further investigate what's going on here. So to confirm the prevalence rate is accurate, we would check our community onset events from the line list, and we would check our number of admissions from the FACWIDE and denominator form. Okay, and then the bonus question, how would this data quality issue impact the SIR? So if we assume that this prevalence rate is incorrect, that something happened when the facility um, when they entered their admissions, maybe they entered the wrong number of admissions and it was too low. Okay, so this prevalence rate is high and a high prevalence rate will lead to a higher number of predicted events. And if we assume that nothing else changed in the SIR, when the number of predicted events increases, it can lead to a decrease in the SIR. Okay. Um, Karen and myself, as well as Denise, will be up at the front if anyone wants to ask us some questions.